Welcome to the Ninja Coaching Coast to Coast podcast, where our mission is to help you learn and grow by sharing the tips, ideas, tricks, and more that we learn from speaking with top producing real estate agents around the country every single day. I'm Matt Benelli here with Ninja Coaching founder and owner Garrett Fry. And although we focus a lot on real estate, this podcast is not just for real estate agents. It is for anyone who is looking to better their business and increase their income per hour in order to enjoy all of the things that life has to offer. So prepare to take in a lot of value that you can put into action in your business and your life. Enjoy the show. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, Garrett Fry here, and so excited. Uh, Matt Benelli is on the phone also. Matt, please say hello. Hello, everybody. There he is. You know, in, in today's marketplaces, uh, we have been watching pricing. You know, pricing is becoming such an incredible, interesting process. I think that things that we were able to get away with years ago, uh, and I think it's always been this way, but it hasn't been as sensitive. Pricing sensitivity right now in today's marketplace is over the top. And Matt, I know we, we've briefly talked about this, but I know you're seeing it also, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think every market is experiencing some level of, I think, what you're about to describe. And so for anybody who's thinking like, oh, well, like what my market's different. It's like, well, really think about what we're talking about here when it as it relates to pricing and the sensitivity of it, because it's not so simple as just slapping a list price on and going out on the market. No, it's not. And that's where I'm watching people get into a lot of trouble right now. And the trouble is being caught by two sides of it. One is the realtors uh, are very much responsible for at least homes sitting on the marketplace. If you see a home sitting on the marketplace right now, nine times out of 10, you can look to the realtor, the realtor pushed the price. And again, there's also realtors that are, I hope everybody takes this the right way, but there are realtors that are weak out there and they go, but my client wanted that price. So we just took it and ran with it. And we did that. Yeah, they're they're too accepting of like, oh yeah, let's let's go try it and doing that without a plan behind it. You got to bring clarity to your clients on where we're going here. The objective is to get these homes sold, not just list them. Well, and I think the pricing sensitivity, Matt, it kind of comes into play right now because we just came out of a marketplace where people are not used to seeing days on market. That's been something that's been gone for a while. If that home had, you know, a week on the marketplace, that that was a really big issue. That people would look at and go, well, what's wrong with the property? Like, why isn't it sold? Why is it still sitting here? Like, it's a beautiful home. That right there is still in people's minds. But now the marketplace is starting to change a little bit. We got a little bit of a softer marketplace. We're not seeing the appreciation levels. I am seeing way more of a balanced market. But now we have this fearful of days on market. We've got this other side over here that we do definitely need to price this property properly so that people see it. And if we are even a smidge over on price, like a smidge, <laughs> dude, we're dead. And I keep telling people, you're so much better going, like try and hit market value or either going low. Like if you hit market value or go low, you're great. Things are going to move forward. This property will sell. The people will move on. Life will continue. You're a smidge over. Oh man, you're, you're stuck. And I'm seeing that every single day right now, but people aren't taking it as seriously as I'd like them to see it. And I, I think, Matt, you're seeing the same thing with us. They're just not taking it seriously enough. They don't take it seriously. And they don't know how this, I mean, they, real estate agents, are not doing a good enough job of communicating the seriousness to their sellers. Sometimes I feel like it's, was there an economics class that was missed or something that just isn't wasn't understood about how markets work? Because the real estate market works like any other market, supply and demand, that's where, like Garrett, you said it so perfectly, like a smidge overpriced, you miss the demand that is there by doing that versus being in the price range where the demand is. And you can carry the price back up. If you're slightly below market, but you have the demand pinned at a certain point, like the, the price is going to come back up to where it should be. Equilibrium will be matched. We're not saying list houses at a dollar and watch the price come up, but don't be so scared about being competitive in your market because that's actually how, I mean, Look at companies that sell product, right? The ones that are competitive in their marketplace sell the most product and make the most money. That's what these sellers can do too. If they want to sell their homes and get to where they want to be on time, they need to be competitive. And I think the real estate agents are scared of doing that. And so I don't know, Garrett, have you seen, is it like a lack of just conceptualization of what a market should perform like, or is it just they're trying to please their clients too much? 
Well, I, I think one is is that they want to please the client. I think a lot of it is is that they don't have the right tools or strategies to be able to explain the marketplace to their clients. Um, I think in the last couple of years, we haven't had to have the tools. The market's hot. Let's get it on. Let's go. Right. Like, yeah. let's just get this thing going. I don't need to sit here and explain to you that there's X amount of homes that just recently sold in your neighborhood. Um, we don't need to do that. Yeah, it was like, here, here's the comps, fair market value. Most sellers are accept. Speed is king. Let's go. Yeah. So we got we got a little lazy. We got lazy with those systems. We got lazy with interpreting the marketplace. And all of a sudden, again, coming into this market, it's extremely important. Now, the other side of I think of that high side of pricing that people have to be careful with is, is that we also started to see it as the market, even when it was going pretty hot. If you were high on price, people would look at that and say, it's already high. I don't want to get into a bidding war and push this thing up even higher. Like, I don't even want to play ball with that. That mentality is still there with with people right now. I think with agents and with buyers that they'll see a property and they're like, yeah, no, I, I don't want to get involved with that. But now you talk about supply and demand. You know, I, I like to use grocery stores. Grocery stores are like, uh, you, you, you can look, go to your average grocery store and you can look around at the products on the shelves and you'll understand really quickly. Like sometimes you'll see when they, when they over purchase product and all of a sudden they get too much of it on the shelf. Guess what guys, it goes on sale. That's what happens. They put them on two for one, half price, buy one, get one half price. That happens. It's a reality of a marketplace and it's not bad. It just means that <laughs> <laughs> this is what we got to do to be competitive out here and to, to move this stuff through. Uh, homes are a little bit different because I watch agents that go, can we build enough value into it? Can we take nice enough photos? Can we have it staged? Can we? Yeah, you actually can affect the price by doing all these great things and having pre-home inspections done and eliminating negotiation periods uh, because the home is ready to go. It's, you know, it's that cream puff. But there's a top. There's a place there where all of a sudden you hit the top of the market value. And that's where when you cross that threshold and for whatever the product is, if you cross that threshold, that's where the market says, nope, I'm not playing with you anymore. And we're going to go somewhere else. That is so important too. what you talked about with like what we can do to help support a price or help bring the price up to that cream puff condition. And I think what happens most of the time is agents will back into that. They'll go at a price. They'll they'll be talking price and they'll say, well, maybe we can stage it to help or maybe we can do this to help to support that. And it's like, no, 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 no. We're doing it the wrong way. Let's start with saying, hey, we are going to stage this. We are going to have professional photography. We are going to do a music video. I don't know, whatever. You're going to do all these great things. Things, and that will give us <laughs> price X. Don't, you don't don't, don't support do a music price video. X. With it. <laughs> don't do a music video, please. Anybody out there, don't do a music video. <laughs> Sorry. Well, you, you know what I mean, though. I mean, like, we just back into it instead of just starting with this is going to be the marketing program that's going to help get us to price instead of saying, here's the price. And now let's just try to support that with all this extra stuff that maybe will work. I don't know. Versus knowing, hey, this is what will work and this is the price it'll get us. Let's let's move it in the right. Let's do the process the right way. Yeah. With days on market right now, and this is where we got to be careful about. We came out of a marketplace where days on market were very scary. My friend Mike Doyle up in Seattle said this a couple years ago, which I absolutely loved. Like for me, this painted the perfect picture. He said, days on market are like past lovers to your prospective new mate. <laughs> the, the fewer you have, the better. Yeah. And it, he always would, he wrapped that with, if you're going to have them, let's make them count. Now, that doesn't work for everybody. He actually was known, he, I think, said that to a handful of his clients with actually kind of getting them to see the marketplace. But for me, like, that's a really clear picture of what we don't want. I don't want to accumulate days on market. I, I don't want to look at a house that's accumulated days on market. Like, for me, it's got a whole bunch of bad juju that's, that's trailing around with that thing. We got to get ahead of that and we've got to you know, educate people. So Matt, now what are you seeing out there for tools to educate people right now, to educate you know, the homeowners? Because we got all kinds of great tools. There are tons of tools out there, tons of good stats. I mean, so, and for the ninjas out there, you know this tool. Focus First is my favorite quote unquote tool. It's an Excel program that you can download information from your MLS, pop it in, and it'll give you all these different charts and everything. And depending on your market in terms of what types of properties that you have in there, whether or not price per square foot really makes sense for you, whether it's you know lot sizes or different things like this. The one thing that does remain constant is 
you know, supply and demand of a market. And the pond that you can use as a visualization tool to at least start with, here's what the market looks like, the pond and the odds, which come out of the focus first, which you don't need focus first to use these tools, by the way. You can create these on your own in a spreadsheet or whatever, but to show how the market is currently operating. When you take things like the odds, right? People say, oh, what's your odds of selling? And many, many people don't start with that. But when you calculate, here's the market. And in great markets too, this is important because most people don't pay attention to the homes that don't sell. And in hot markets, there are homes that don't sell. And the odds will show you that. If the odds of selling in a market is 67%, which is actually not too bad, most people will say, wait, 67%? That's, that's not too bad? It's like, well, yeah. there are some markets that are 14%. Try that. That all of a sudden introduces the seller to say, okay, this is the reality of the supply and demand. And now let's talk about how we can increase our odds to be the homes that do sell, the ones that are 100%. And I love starting with that and then using the pond as a visual for that. So those are some of my favorite tools out of fear of going much further down that road. You tell me. Well, so real quick, you know, you're talking about the odds of selling. I used to train with a gentleman named Zan Monroe, uh, who's been involved with Ninja and he's an incredible instructor. If anybody of you knows Zan Monroe, you'll know that he's a, it's like you, you go watch Zan Monroe. Zan's incredible. But what Zan taught me, which I loved, is when you talk about like, the odds of selling and you said 67% of homes out there sell right now. That's what we're seeing that are actually selling. He would then flip that and he'd say, so what is it? The opposite was it? We have 30, 33. 33. 33% of the homes have been rejected. <laughs> I love that. I used to love how he'd say that. The market rejected 33% of the homes that came on the marketplace. People go, what do you mean by that? He goes, they're, they're rejected. Nobody bought them. They came on and they left. They said, go away. We don't want to play with you, but these are the ones that we will buy. And I always love that mentality with explaining that to somebody. To get them the picture that this is not a 100% win game here. There will be some that will send home with their tail between their legs going, we were not successful. For those of you who happen to maybe be in a neighborhood or a market where everything is selling, take certain things with a grain of salt, but you are going to experience a market where not everything sells. It, it's it's just the reality of the real estate marketplace and how things ebb and flow. There's going to be homes that get rejected for many, many different reasons. One could be the real estate agent not really paying attention and guiding on price. The other could be maybe it's not a real seller. When you're going through and looking at this, some people might say, well, but that house expired, then came back on, then was withdrawn, and then came back on and sold. So it actually did sell. It's like, yeah, but look at how many at-bats it took. If you're playing baseball and you hit a home run at your fourth at-bat, you're still one for four. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like, oh, he's the greatest in the world. He hit a home run. He's like, yeah, and he struck out the other three times. You know, you got to count the at-bats because the mission of a seller is to sell the home to get somewhere else by a certain time. Even if that time is not solidly determined, that's the reason. There's opportunity cost to time. And people don't pay attention to that enough, which is why it's important to pay attention to these odds. You're talking about odds here for a second. By the way, I've never seen a marketplace that it's 100%. I've seen very, very, very hot markets. I've never seen a marketplace that 100% of the homes that came on the market, 100% of them sold. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't exist. There's always properties that will be rejected. Uh, I've also seen, and this is the fun part when you really start to understand the odds. Uh, we sold our home in Grants Pass, Oregon. Uh, this is going back about, oh my gosh, about 10 years ago. Hard to believe. You know, it was interesting was when we did the odds of selling in our marketplace, we had a 4% chance of selling in 30 days. It means if we put on the marketplace, there was only 4% odds that we would actually receive an offer. We had a 96% chance that we would not receive an offer. And I think the beauty thing with odds when you're explaining this to somebody is that it doesn't get better. You know, next month, when you run the odds again, if it's had 4% chance of selling again, it's not like, oh, well, we already went through one, so our odds are better now because we've been in the marketplace and we're, we're getting through inventory. <laughs> no. no, there's more inventory coming on all the time. Your odds are exactly the same. And unless you change something or you go outside the box, we're not going to have success. And you, you've got to look at it from that perspective, where, again, a lot of people go like, well, we're just going to ride this out. You may ride it out for a long, long, long time. And that's not, that's not a mentality you want to get into. You know, that's a good point, too, because a lot of people will try to price for the future. They'll say, well, the market's changing, right? 
And I totally think that if somebody is talking to a seller and you're talking about pricing today and they're like, well, we're, we're not really going to list until the fall, you want to update that pricing because things will change. But it's not like you can price for the future thinking that some amazing thing is going to happen in the next five or six months that's going to dramatically change your price point because all of those other homes that are coming on the market today are going to go through the market at their current price. It's not like all of a sudden... Like what you said, right? You had a 4% chance of selling, which means there were probably a lot of other homes on the market. The only way that your odds would dramatically increase is if every single one of those homes just left the market and never came back. <laughs> and then tons of buyers yeah. came in, which would have been like a miracle for something like that to happen. And so don't price for the future. And also don't price for the past either, right? Don't always look so far back and say, well, that has to be our pricing. Because if your market's declining, then your pricing in the past, you're going to have a serious issue as well. This is where having good tools is, is imperative because it allows you to interpret the marketplace in real time. If you don't have good tools, you are going way too far far back sometimes to be able to make an educated decision or you're going like, well, what should we do to bank, you know, to kind of get ahead of the marketplace here? And you don't want to do that. Going back to that house in Grants Pass, I had numerous people that came to that house uh, and I was a real estate agent at the time. I loved it. I had my home. I actually had another realtor listed because I didn't want to be involved in my own sale. I remember so many people came on going like, yeah, your home is underpriced by about $30,000. And I kept going like, got it. Thank you for your input. Like, love it. And they would leave and people would come back. We had big brokers tours. And they kept telling me it's, it's underpriced by about 30000 Great. I love it. We were under contract in 30 days in a marketplace that, you know, again, only 4% of the homes were going under contract. So this is the other part that I want to switch over to here is that part of being successful in any type of market, especially one that's kind of shifting a little bit, is I always tell people, stop and ask yourself, am I listing a home or am I listing a seller? And what I mean by that is all these pricing tools only work if you're talking to a seller. Sellers need to sell. They need to go somewhere. They need to, they need to get to that next place. They got schools for their kids that are starting on a certain date. They got to be in that neighborhood that they're not in right now. They've got a job that's starting somewhere. They got a baby coming and they need more space. All these pieces define or create what's called a seller. If those things don't exist and somebody's just going like, well, I think the market's topped out right now. And I, I've always been told buy low, sell high. And I feel like we're at that point of selling high right now. Let's see what we can get for this thing. You can have all the pricing tools in the world to go, yeah, this is where you need to be if you want to sell right now. But you're going to be sitting there with somebody going, yeah, but I want to, I want to go and I want to push for this. I want to get it up to this level up here. That means you're listing a home. They don't need to go anywhere. That will always lead you to despair and hurt and upset and frustration. Like, and, many, no, and many more past lovers of days on market. <laughs> oh, God, yeah, exactly. You're just going to start adding those things up. And so I, I just, you know, start there. Start start with the, again, am I working with the seller? Great. And then like focus first. Oh my gosh, it is such an amazing tool. You know, you can interpret between the pond, between the, I love the scattergram. Oh, scattergram is the, is the end all be all for fair market value. I've never seen, I, I've never had it fail me. I've made it and gone like, wow, it's like, it looks like it exploded sometimes. And it's usually because it's like, okay, I have some wrong data in here. Like I, yeah. I need to fine tune this a little bit. But when you find the right area and once you practice and you get good enough at it, you, you, we've been using the analogy on our podcast of the guitar, you know, treat it like an instrument, treat it like something that you need to sit there and figure out and you need to fine tune. Don't just accept that it's just, you're just going to push buttons and you got your results. Really figure it out. And if you do, I, Gosh, it's a great tool to have somebody who doesn't understand real estate, doesn't sell homes every day to be able to go, oh, that's what we need to do. So focus first is a great one. It's the visual aspect of it, right? Which is why they call it a visual pricing tool, because most real estate agents, even many of you listening right now, your CMA is made up of a bunch of MLS sheets. And remember, go back to the first time that you looked at an MLS sheet. You were like, what the heck is this? I have no idea what information is what. And that's exactly what your sellers are saying. I don't even think you need to go back to the first time. Most agents <laughs> today, right now, <laughs> if I was sitting in the car with them and I said, what year was this home built? Yeah, it's like, wait, hold on. Uh, there you it is. can't find it in there. <laughs> 
Yeah. So don't bring that confusion to your sellers. It's just not, it's not fair. So give them something that's visual that they can see that makes sense. And, and focus first does it so beautifully. But Garrett, you, before we started recording, you were talking about one part of focus first and one great tool that I think is really great. Cause we talked about being competitively priced and we can look at all the market data and say, okay, based on this data, that's what it is. But sometimes the sellers need to have a clear vision of what the competition is. And this is one of your favorite tools, right? What you're, well, what I think you're about to say. What do you think I'm about to say? No, I won't, I won't put you on the spot. <laughs> um, <it's, laughs> absorber, if I get this absorber, wrong, it's going to be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Absorber, absorption rate positioning is, is another one of the ones that I, I lean to a lot. Now, again, I was doing real estate before we had some of these tools that like would really help us analyze and interpret the marketplace without us having to do too much or get too involved. And I'm a big one that likes to get my hands in the numbers. You would never know that by me because I've I'm not the best at math. <laughs> I'm not the best. I was like, hmm, I'm not like a new stats person. <laughs> But there was something about it when I was like, okay, I'm going to help people understand this market. And I would get fascinated by the numbers. Absorption rate positioning really helped me be able to see it from a different position. So first part of absorption rate positioning is you need to understand the inventory in the marketplace and how fast we're absorbing that, that inventory out of it. So when you ever hear somebody say, well, the absorption rate, it literally is trying to figure out two things. One is how many homes are coming off the market? How many of them are being absorbed by the marketplace at any given time? And then the other piece is at the rate we're selling at, how long will it take us to clear all the inventory out that we have? You need to know that. It's really important information to know whether you have a system that'll do it for you. I used to actually do it every single month. I would do it for every price range in my marketplace, whether I was listing a home there or not. What would happen was, is I would save those data points. This is for absorption rates. And the beauty is, and again, there's a lot of companies out there. I'll talk to people and they're like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. My company does that for me. They they tell me the absorption rate every month. Got that. And that's great. What I'm talking about is when you can look at six months worth of absorption rates for a certain price range, let's take the price range of 300,000. And I could sit there and say, look, okay, back in November, we had 4.4 months of inventory. December, we had 4.7. In January, we've now got five. Well, now I've got a trend line, and this trend line is extremely powerful. Um, I've worked with lots of different companies out there. I've actually worked with Tim DeLeon. He's the owner of uh, Focus First to see if we can figure out how to computer generate this. We haven't figured it out. The data in the MLS gets contaminated once you get past that month. Can't go look up actives, let's say, for four months back. So it's really one of those things you've got to kind of stay on top of. You just got to do it every single month, understanding this. Because I used to sit down with my clients and be like, look, here's the trend line. Every single month, we've gone up by one month of inventory, and the absorption rate's gone up by this to absorb it all out of it. Don't mess around with the prices. We are drastically right now heading towards a buyer's market. You don't want to play with this marketplace. We need to get you out of here now. That was a great, it was a great way to do it. And again, I'd love to find a way to automate it more for people. But if you get the time and you want to do it, it's a great tool to have. Now, when we talk about absorption rate positioning, There's a lot to this, but here's the simplistic side of it. First thing you do is you need to come up with a search based off of the buyers that are looking for the property that you're trying to sell. So if I was trying to sell my house right now, I would not necessarily look for four bedroom, three bath homes at 2,400 square feet. What I'd be looking for is people that would buy this house, families. What other homes would they be looking at on today's marketplace? How would I do a search that if they were my buyer, I would show them all these other homes also? You've got to work with those numbers because you've got to see what your direct competition is out there. It's not just four bedroom, three bath houses. Does that make sense, Matt? A hundred percent. I love the way you described that too, because so many people will be like, well, why why can't I just set the MLS search? Because it's easy to set the search that way. It's like, yeah, this is going to take a little bit of effort. You're going to have to actually look at the different properties and really pick the ones that make sense. You're not going to be able to just run a quick search and think that your pricing is going to all of a sudden magically appear. You got to go through this buyer eyes point of view. It's going to be, oh, it's going to be so impactful. Keep going. So you start there, you get that all put together, and then you've got a handful of criteria here. So you've got condition, location, features and amenities, square foot, size, and price. That's it. Those are the five main criteria that people kind of make decisions on homes. So what's interesting, let's say like, let's say we have an absorption rate of maybe we're absorbing five homes per month. 
That's what's coming off the marketplace through the buyer's eyes, through that search we put together, right? We're on the same page? Yep. All right. So if we've got five homes coming off through the buyer's eyes, what we need to look at then and say, okay, we've got 15 homes that are in direct competition with us right now. Five of these homes are going to be gone in the next month. We know that. Five of them are leaving in the next month. There might also be five more that come on. We have to be careful of those. We'll talk about that in a second. But of those five that are on there, what we're going to do is say, okay, condition. Which one's in the best condition? Well, that one over there is a new construction. By the way, new constructions always get first place. Always. I don't (laughs) care about your landscaping and all the other stuff that you've done to it. People always look at a new construction because they're looking at the model homes most likely if you're looking at a new construction neighborhood, which is going to be the cream puff. It just is. Yes. No, it doesn't get first place in the overall, but it gets first place when it comes to condition. Yes. That's it. Now we need to find out where we fall into that. Are we number three, four, five? Are we number 10 when it comes to condition? Maybe we're number 15. We got to figure that out. But we're going to put a literally a number on where we sit in this market. Okay. Then we're going to go to location. Based off the buyer that's looking at this, where do we fit into the location side of it? And we're going to put a pinpoint on there. Okay. We're for the type of buyer that would buy this, we're really at about like a two. Like it's a family home. We're close to schools. Kids can walk to it. We're close to the shopping center. Kids can go down and get downtown really easily. You're going to figure that out on there. When we talk about features and amenities, what kind of things that would resonate with a family type residence? And again, look at the direct competition out there. How do we rank? And it's not a scale of one to 10. It's a scale of whatever homes you're directly in competition with. So, okay, it might be one out of 15. It might be one out of three. You just never know. You got to look at your market. When you're all done, you want to average your numbers together. Now, what you'll notice here is we haven't talked about price. Price is the last one on the list. And the beauty part is, is that you can then sit there and you can map out the price for all the homes that we're in direct competition with. Just make little tick marks out there and just go, okay, this one's priced here, this one's priced here, this one's priced here. And we can just very quickly say, we are right now either in the average, there's going to be five homes that are going to sell, we're in that group of five, or maybe we average out at like eight. And if we average out at eight and we know five homes are going to sell, guess what? We have price to play with here. It's fully in our control. It's the easiest lever to to change. I mean, because you can't change location. So you can literally sit with somebody and say, where should we move this up? How far do we have to come in price or down in price to be able to get our eight now to become in the one through five when we average it out? It is never let me down. If you can get yourself into that average, you've got a really strong shot of getting that property sold, but you've got to be working with a seller that's going to look at it from these, you know, through these eyes with you. If you don't have a seller looking at this with you and you're just trying to sell a home, none of this means anything in the world. Well, and that's why doing this with the seller is also a good idea too. Like you can actually sit with the seller and go through this and you know what, if you need to get the seller in a car and go look at the competition physically, let's do that. This is also a great tool for getting those price reductions too. I mean, continue on with what you're going to say. And I just wanted to interject you doing it with the seller. So, so important. Well, and Matt, so like, again, you just brought up a great point going out and like previewing those homes because every once in a while, you're going to have a seller that's going like, but you don't understand how beautiful my home is. And you're like, great, let's go look at this one. And all of a sudden you're like, you walk into that house and you have, you can watch the look on their face go like, oh, okay, I get it. <laughs> like, this is my competition. Now, yeah. hopefully we don't have to do that with everybody. Like, I would never want everybody having to take all those people out to show them 15 homes. Yeah, you'll, you'll probably annoy some listing agents after you do that for like the third. Do you mind if I bring my seller over again? <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Don't do that. Now, the last thing about this that I just want to quickly throw in there is that even if you do this perfectly, what you need to do is about you know a couple days on the marketplace, maybe a week on the market, you need to do this whole thing again by yourself. Look at the, especially if it's not sold. Just go quickly look and say, are we still in that position of one through five or did somebody cut in front of us? Right. Yeah. New listings and other price reductions, that'll totally in- interrupt your place in line. Yep. So when, when you're doing absorptory positioning, Price and condition are the only two things that you have control over. Location, features and amenities, and uh, lot size and square footage size, you got no control over. Those are constants. Condition, you can only play with before it goes on the market. Once it goes on the market and people have seen it with that, they're always burned into their mind. That's the home with the ugly carpet. You can't come back and fix that later. And again, price is another one. Oh, that's the overpriced home. You guys have all had a buyer in the car where that listing will come back up or it'll be a price reduction. So it'll show back up in your search now. And the actual client will go, oh yeah, that's that one that's overpriced over there on Cumberland. 
it's just burned in. So again, those are the those are your your things variables you have to play with, but you got to do it before it goes on the market. That's one of my favorite systems. You know, that also points to how people look at properties when they come on the market, right? Which is why price is so important and why making sure the condition is where you want it to be before you go on the market is so important too, because those first couple days, right? The first couple days you hit the MLS, you hit the you know Zillow and Realtor.com and the email blast goes out. Every buyer in the market right then is seeing that home. If it doesn't fit their profile, they now take that home and put it out of their realm of possibility. And now you have to wait for new buyers to come into the marketplace who might fit your pricing and condition profile and all those other things. And that is not that is not a position you want to be in because it's not a winning it's not a winning position. That's a well, it's a losing position, unfortunately. Well, the way it was explained to me, and it's interesting is I haven't talked about this in a while just because the the marketplace and kind of where it's been, but the visual that I've always liked, Larry Kendall taught this to me, which is the parade. There's the parade of buyers out there in the marketplace, and they're waiting for a new property to hit the marketplace. And that's just, Matt, what you just said, is the minute it hits, the parade gets to come and see your house. (laughs) I have this great visualization of hundreds of buyers marching down a street. And then like all of a sudden, this little for sale sign appears out of the ground in front of a house and they all start (laughs) running towards it and gather around it. And then they all go, oh, and walk away. (laughs) Well, yeah. And that's the thing. The parade doesn't come twice. It's one time. So what you're waiting for then, if you miss the parade, and this is going to become more and more and more sensitive as the marketplace shifts in the direction that it is going. I mean, if anybody doesn't think that this marketplace in maybe one, two years, three years out, it's going to be very different than what we've experienced. I mean, you get ready. We're going to see some big changes, I think, going on. But with that being said, that parade only comes once. And that's going to become more and more and more apparent as we get moving forward here. And with that parade only coming once, if it passes... Now you're waiting for new buyers to enter the marketplace. We're not waiting for the parade to see us again. We're waiting for brand new people that have not seen us yet to come and say, oh, that's a cool house. I wonder why it's still here. And that's a bad situation to be in. You don't want to get there when you've missed the parade. And Larry said this too. Who's the smartest people in the marketplace? Oh, the buyers. The buyers. Because oh, they're seeing long. everything. They see everything. The sellers are focused on their home. The buyers are focused on every single home. And for you real estate agents who are not using a buyer process to help keep them focused, you know, right? They go on Zillow and they're like, oh, how about let's go see this home and this home and this one too. Oh, and also there's this one that just came on and this one's got to make me move. And this one like is a for sale by owner and blah, blah, blah. They know everything. So we need to look at our properties that we're listing through these buyers' eyes. Because if we appeal to the parade that comes through, you're going to have more than one offer. You're going to have the whole parade standing there and and holding an auction in front of the house, raising that price up, which is going to be awesome. Your seller is going to love that. Just as you talked about with smart buyers out there, there's no way a realtor can analyze the amount of neighborhoods that all their buyers are looking at at the level that all those guys are analyzing them. It is not a good use of your time either. I don't want you to do that. When it comes time to make decisions, you better be able to go in and quickly be able to interpret that marketplace and understand what, what's going on there. Yeah, 100%. So we got, got focus first. We got absorption rate. Again, all these, what we're, everything we're talking about right now is really to hone in on a very price sensitive market and make sure that you're not pushing the price too much. Oh, well, but it, it, it works. Focus first, I will say, works in, in every market. Whether you're in a high end luxury market that's not moving, you're like, well, I don't really have comparables when it comes to size and square footage. Use the right data, first of all. Oh, well, I can't compare a five acre property with a 30 acre property. Yeah, you just have to get creative. And I think if you're not willing to take the time to learn the specific marketplace and tweak the tools to work for your seller's benefit, then, you know, what are you doing listing houses and, and going through listing consultations, first of all? Second of all, even if you're marketplace is not extremely price sensitive, your sellers still have a mission to get where they want to go. And you need to make sure you use the tools to verify that maybe you're not price sensitive or that you really are. You know, you can't just escape without doing the analysis and still hitting the pricing on the nose. Oh, yeah. Be, be careful of this marketplace. It's a very fun market. I'm watching a lot. I, I keep telling everybody, I think we're going to see more volume go through this marketplace in the next, gosh, 12 months than we've probably seen in a long time. It's actually really interesting because I think that the marketplace we just came out of felt like it had more volume because people were writing so many darn offers and there were so many you know, situations where they you know, were competing and stuff and the energy was so high. But it really wasn't high volume. 
And I think we're going to see really high volume come out of this next 12 months. But again, as you get more volume, as we have more homes sitting on the marketplace, remember everybody showing is better than telling. You've got to be able to give the information, educate those uh, sellers out there so they can make smart decisions. Don't just tell them. Don't just tell them the information. Don't just talk to them. You've got to be able to sit down and be like, here, this is what we're dealing with. And th- I have a path that's going to help you get to the other side. As, La- as Larry's going to say, he's always said is, uh, and again, we haven't had to do this as much, but there's a point where we have to walk them through the valley of the shadow of death. And the valley of the shadow of death in real estate is basically saying that, hey, there's a chance here that we might not sell, but I'm going to show you the path and I'm going to show you how I'm going to help you get there. And uh, there's a couple of things. The parade and the valley of the shadow of death has not come out of my mouth in a while, but we're going to start to have to think that way again here coming forward. I'm not saying the marketplace is going to be ugly. I'm just saying we need to educate the right way. Yeah, we just need to be proactive and be real advisors when it comes to pricing. And and when you were mentioning the volume, you know, versus number of offers written, I think something to be very careful of is choose your stats wisely and explain your stats correctly. Because I think a lot of people say, oh, well, there's more home selling. So the market must be getting better. It's like, well, hold on. Let's also look at what's happened with the demand. Let's also take a look at what's happened with the inventory combined with time of year and everything. Because just because more homes are selling doesn't necessarily mean one thing or the other. It doesn't mean we can price higher. doesn't mean anything necessarily specific. That stat in a vacuum means nothing. And so just be careful with what stats you choose to use and explain, whether it's in cash conversation or through an entire pricing analysis with your seller. Just as you said, Matt, what I've seen is that you'll, when this word goes back to the difference of months of inventory and a, probably how many properties we're absorbing in a marketplace where all of a sudden like there's a lot of volume and a lot of homes being sold, it's very easy to look at that and go, oh, man, we're absorbing this many homes per month. Like the market's got to be getting better. And then all of a sudden you sit there and go, how many months at this new rate of absorption Is it going to take for us to get through all of this inventory? And you're like, wait, that doesn't make sense. Back then it was only two, and now it's at 10 months of inventory. Or that's extreme, but then now it's at five or six months of inventory. Like, I thought it was getting better. Yeah, there's more homes going through, but... There's a whole lot more sitting on the market right now, which means that your your actual chances are were better back then, even though there's more homes selling. And I know for the luxury agents out there listening in certain areas anyway, because I know I experienced this in New Jersey, where if you look at certain markets at certain price points, we're talking like 40 to 50 months of inventory. Try moving a house in, an, <laughs> in, an, in a market like that. You got to price it super aggressively. That's when you go on sale. Yeah. That's when you walk into the supermarket and there's a whole aisle. Or usually, I know this is the way it happens in my supermarket, there'll be that shopping cart in the middle of the aisle. And it has all the stuff that they have too much inventory of. And it's like, buy me, I'm, ha- I'm, a- I'm half price. And you know what, though? It works. If you have a seller who really needs to sell, and this happened to us. We had somebody who really, I mean, after years and years on the market, they're like, we got to do it. It's like, well, we got to put the property on sale. And they're like, I don't know if we're ready to do it. We're talking about, I think it was a $1.5 million price reduction. It was massive. And we're talking about a home that was priced somewhere around like four or something. So it was like almost a 50% reduction. It got people interested. And the house sold and the seller was happy because they were able to move on with their life. So if you are in that market and you, you're like, okay, your brain got to start thinking we need to go on sale. I had an agent recently that said, uh, he said, yeah, he goes, there's just no buyers in the marketplace right now for a home like this. Like we just need to wait. Does your seller need to sell? He goes, oh yeah, no, they, they definitely need to sell, but they're just going to have to wait this out. And I said, you need to go talk to your seller because as you just said, Matt, it might need to go on sale. Like we might need to come up with a sale price on this house. And he said, no, no, you don't get it. There's just not anybody out here right now. I said, believe me. I said, you're selling a $1.5 million house. It's probably worth about $1.5 million. I said, if you price it, and I'm not telling people to go this aggressive, but if you price it at a million, I might drive up and buy it. Like if there's a potential of $500,000 worth of equity, now that's an extreme sale, but there's always a place there where all of a sudden buyers will come flying out of the woodworks and buy a property if you have a seller that really needs to sell. There's so many variables. I mean, when you look at pricing a home, and this is where I love it when somebody goes like, well, what's my home worth right now? Well, there are so many variables between what are you willing to do to the house? You know, what, what are all these factors? And do you really need to sell and how fast do you need to sell? And when you put all of that stuff together and you're, you interpret all of that the right way, you'll be able to make your client happy. They will be satisfied with the results, but you've got to have them in the game with you. You've got to know what their plan is, and then we can help guide them. So uh, 
be careful out there, everybody. That's all. That's all I want to say is be careful with pricing right now because it can, it can bite you. I have a feeling that we're going to be talking about pricing again. <laughs> Maybe not very soon, but uh, there. I just see in our future with the way the markets are going, in a good way, by the way, if you guys want to be super successful, we're not saying that there's anything devastating coming, but I just have a feeling we're going to be talking about pricing again, and uh, it's going to be it's going to be fun. I 100%. I don't believe there's anything devastating out there. I have people that are coming to me going, ah, doom and gloom, the market, whatever. I actually think that from a real estate business perspective, this is a marketplace that will allow you to have literally the biggest year you've ever had or years coming up. People need to sell. There's buyers in the marketplace. Anytime you have both of them in the marketplace at the same time, amazing things happen. Lack of sellers with a whole lot of buyers, you will beat your head against a wall. Lack of buyers with a whole bunch of sellers, you will beat your head against a wall. We just need to make sure that we look at this marketplace the right way. I actually think it's an amazing marketplace, but you just need to be careful. It's active. Oh, it's so active. It's great. I mean, this is this is why we got into this business, folks. I mean, an active marketplace should make you happy. Let's go out and make some connections and, and help some people achieve their goals. I mean, it is ready for you to do it. All you got to do is go out there, guide your people, guide your buyers, help your sellers find the right price. And remember, at the end of the day, it matters who says it. If you go in there and say, you got to price it here and you don't use these tools that Garrett and I have been discussing, you, you're going to have a confused seller. But if you go in there and use these tools and they say, aha, this is where I need to be. Oh man, you're golden. That house is going to sell. Yeah. And these two, and these two, the tools we talked about today are not the only tools. All I want you guys to be looking at is that whatever you use, is it explaining the marketplace in a way that the client can understand it and they can make smart decisions? There's lots of tools out there. Focus first isn't the only way. Absorption rate positioning isn't the only way. There's lots of tools out there that will allow you to sit there and say, okay, let's, let's interpret the marketplace. So, I mean, you can even do all the numbers yourself and show them your research that you've done and, and map it all out. Whatever it is, just make sure that you can help them interpret what's going on and how they need to position themselves in there. So Matt, if you don't mind, I'm, I, I've, uh, I've enjoyed this topic. I love it. This is great. I want to say thank you to everybody, as always, for showing up and participating in, in our podcast. And uh, we're having so much fun doing it. Just continue to tune in. And uh, again, if you have any topics, ideas, things you want to share with us, we're in. Absolutely. I echo Garrett's comments. Thank you, everybody. Have an amazing, amazing day. Thanks, guys. Thank you for joining us here on the Ninja Coaching Coast to Coast podcast. We appreciate your time and attention. If you receive some value out of this episode, we would love for you to share it, subscribe to the podcast, and if you feel so compelled, to leave us a review. Have an amazing day. We'll see you soon.